Hi, and welcome back to the second part of the Social Learning Strategies Lecture. Okay, so we'll be considering two more categories of context-dependent social learning strategies in this uh, lecture section. So that will be frequency-dependent social learning strategies and model-based cultural transmission biases. So if we look at frequency dependent strategies first, these relate to contexts where individuals use social information according to the frequency with which they observe the trait in the population around them. And the most famous of these biases is conformity. The term conformity is not an alternative way of saying social learning, but it has a specific meaning in this field. So conformity is actually um, disproportionately copying the behavior displayed by the majority. This can be understood by looking at this figure here, where the y-axis indicates the probability of adopting a behavior and the x-axis the proportion of the population demonstrating that behavior. And if individuals copy or adopt a behavior in proportion to what they observe, you would see a pattern as indicated by the uh, dashed line here. And this copying in proportion uh, to the proportion of individuals displaying a behavior in the population can be achieved by simply randomly choosing an individual to copy, which is why it is known as unbiased social learning. And we can compare the, uh, the so-called S-shaped curve of conformity to this unbiased social learning. So for conformity, as you can see, when the learned behavior is common, say at 75% of the population, the probability of adopting the behavior is actually greater than 75%. Um, <clears throat> so greater than the uh, proportion of the population demonstrating the behavior. <coughs> Likewise, when the learned behavior is rare, say at 25% down here, uh, the probability of adopting the behavior is less than the proportion of the population demonstrating the behavior. However, use of the term conformity has been a little bit confusing in the literature. Um, but before we get into that, let's see a great illustration of a disproportionate tendency to copy the majority in action. Um, so this is a short video of an open air concert in the USA <clears throat> some years ago. So at this point, it took quite a while for one other person to join this crazy dancer. And as you can see, people are not joining them because they're currently rare in the population. Now you can see that quite a lot of the population are joining now, so you start to see this disproportionate tendency to copy the majority. As they become the majority in the population, everybody suddenly flocks to join them. Okay, I think you get the idea there. Um, so this was uh, quite nice evidence of a disproportionate tendency to copy the majority. And that's what we often mean by conformity. But there is an alternative meaning to conformity, which is to do with peer pressure. And this is where individuals conform by discounting their personal information in favor of perceived community norms. 
And this comes from the famous social psychology, social psychology studies by Solomon Ash in the 1950s. And it doesn't involve disproportionate copying of the majority at all. So in Ash's studies, individuals actually denied their own judgment of which line was longest when they're presented three lines like this. Um, and um, they would deny their own judgment if um, confederates in, in the group who'd been told to give incorrect answers gave a different answer. So for example, if they said the longest line is definitely line C. Um, so the influence of these confederates actually on reversing the subject's judgments increased as these confederates increased in number. Um, so this conformity effect is diminished if individuals get to write down their answer rather than give it verbally to the group. Um, and this is because peer pressure is reduced if you can give your answer secretly. So this is why this uh, version of conformity is more to do with peer pressure than uh, frequency dependence. Now, if you remember the previous lecture segment, the type of conformity that Erica described in the video of her study with vervet monkeys was more similar to this meaning of conformity, um, so uh, about fitting in, uh, than to a frequency dependence interpretation. Okay, so I said that the issue of conformity was a thorny one, and it doesn't stop with the two different types of conformity I just outlined. There's also a confusion regarding what majority actually means. So the adaptive benefit of conformity in terms of enabling the observer to use the collective wisdom of those surrounding him or her, rather than learning for themselves, dictates that observers should copy the behavior displayed by the majority of individuals, not just the behavior that they see demonstrated most often in the population. Now, a study by Daniel Howne et al. nicely demonstrates this point. So here, apes got to observe demonstrators placing balls in one of three boxes to retrieve a reward. So in the majority condition, observers saw three different individuals each use the yellow box once. And in the minority condition, the same individual used the blue box uh, to gain a reward three times. So although in both conditions, the observers see three identical behaviors, it's only in the majority condition that they have the opportunity to gain collective wisdom as three different individuals provide them with information. And as you can see in the results, uh, chimpanzees and humans tended to copy the majority represented in black on this figure rather than the minority, which is represented in gray. So uh, chimpanzees and humans did uh, tend to gain collective wisdom by copying the majority of individuals. But this wasn't the case for orangutans. And it's thought that this could be because the more solitary social system of orangutans gives them less opportunity to collect information from multiple different individuals. Hence, they don't distinguish between this major majority and minority condition. Now, as I previously mentioned, it's very difficult to study social learning strategies in wild animals. But one great example of such a study is that of Lucy Aplin and colleagues who studied a population of great tits living in a wood in Oxford in the UK. And this population has been studied for decades. So in this study, one subpopulation was trained to push uh, this door on this task here to the left. And one subpopulation was trained to push the door to the right. Um, and they could retrieve food from this box by pushing the door to one side or the other. So from these trained innovators, uh, there was actually a very rapid transmission of the trait to push the door to the left or right um, to the majority of individuals in each subpopulation. And pushing the door to the left, for example, remained a stable tradition actually over two years, despite quite a bit of turnover in the subpopulation due to deaths and births of the great tits. Now, the author said that this spread of the trait uh, was due to conformity to the majority. And as you can see on this figure, they did find evidence for the characteristic S-shaped or sigmoidal curve, where individuals were disproportionately likely to adopt a trait when it's in the majority in the population. However, in their data, um, they couldn't really distinguish between birds copying the most frequently observed behavior in the population or the behavior exhibited by the majority of individuals. 
So whether this was due to that stricter sense of collective wisdom of conformity is less clear. But the authors also found that 71% of birds who move from one subpopulation to another uh, with a different tradition switched their preference for the direction in which to push the door. And this could also be indicative of conformity. However, it's difficult to say whether this apparent conformity in, can be attributed to frequency dependent patterns or a state based uh, copy when uncertain type strategy much like the example with wild vervet monkeys that you heard about in the previous lecture segment. But regardless, this study um, emphasizes how social learning in immigrants could aid adoption of locally, locally adaptive information, which would be especially useful in a spatially variable environment where when in Rome do as the Romans do would really make sense for survival. So we now move on to considering the final category of context dependent social learning strategies, and this is uh, model based biases, where individuals copy the behaviour of models according to their identity. And these model based biases are often to do with copying generally successful individuals, such as those that have reached an old age, um, attained high dominance or prestige, or those that have proven themselves proficient in similar domains in the past. So if these individuals have managed to reach old age or attain dominance, then a rule of thumb uh, which influences individuals to copy them should provide a quick and easy means of enabling individuals to copy what is likely to be a beneficial behaviour. Now, model based social learning strategies are also known as indirect biases, and this is because traits of apparently successful or high status individuals are copied irrespective of whether their success or status was influenced by that specific trait. So our tendency to display model based biases is actually taken advantage of in marketing and advertising. So here we have uh, David Beckham. Um, so he's very famous and prestigious and he became famous due to his footballing skills. Yet due to model based bias, his identity can be used to encourage us to adopt traits, uh, so byproducts, uh, despite the fact that he likely knows no more about fizzy drinks or aftershave than you or I do. So as you might expect, there are lots of different types of model based biases, so I'm just going to highlight a few examples. Um, the first example is a bias to copy individuals who are older than yourself. So Alex Thornton, who you heard from in the previous lecture on social learning processes, and his colleague Malapert, established arbitrary traditions in wild meerkats by training demonstrators to forage at novel landmarks. So they um, trained them to feed next to these different types of uh, objects. They then introduced these individuals and the landmarks to meerkat groups and observed the spread of the foraging behaviour. So as you can see on this figure, which gives the probability of being joined at the landmark on the y axis here, um, they found that naive individuals uh, were more likely to join older rather than younger individuals that were foraging at the novel landmarks. And it's thought that this is likely due to the superior foraging experience of older individuals. However, there was no preference for joining dominant individuals over subordinate individuals, even though dominant individuals actually have a higher foraging success in general. And this highlights how we must consider the social context within which individuals are socially learning, even though a copy dominance type model based social learning strategy would seem to be a useful one in the meerkats. In this context, they were probably inhibited from displaying that social learning strategy because it would require them to join dominant individuals at foraging patches. Um, and this incurs a high risk of being attacked by those dominant individuals due to food competition. In recent years, there have been several studies of potential model based biases in the social learning of chimpanzees. Um, so I want to highlight a few. Uh, namely biases for copying dominant individuals, expert individuals and older individuals and highlight potential implications of such model based biases. 
So in four groups of chimpanzees, uh, in a study that I conducted with colleagues, uh, we trained one individual, so the model, to retrieve a, re a food reward from this puzzle box, again, by sliding the door to the left or the right. We then gave the whole group, including the model, access to the box and observed the spread of the task solution. And we recorded who watched who solving the task and whether they saw the door being slid to the left or right and whether they then slid the door to the left or right when they got to interact with the task. And we found greater observation of individuals of higher rank versus the same rank or lower rank as the observer. And we also found a strong effect of most observation of the trained demonstrators, so indicated by D here as demonstrator. And as you would expect, these biases in observation were much stronger for task naive individuals who hadn't performed the task before uh, compared to informed individuals who'd had at least one success with the task. So it seems that chimpanzees observe those individuals who are most likely to provide them with good information, either those who have gained high status, so are generally successful, or individuals who appear to know what they are doing, perhaps due to their purposeful movements at the task. And this is because they were trained uh, quite strongly to um, interact with the task. Now, in a different study of captive chimpanzees, Vicky Horner et al trained pairs of individuals in each group to deposit tokens into different shaped receptacles. As indicated here, they pick up a, a token from the enclosure, uh, put it into either this box or this box, and they gain a food reward. So across the two groups, the remaining group members preferentially copied the model um, A, as you can see in this figure, represented by the dark gray bars, um, and deposited tokens in the receptacle that Model A used. Now, in each of these two groups, Model A was actually older, more dominant than Model B, and had also been a model or demonstrator before in these types of tasks. So this, again, highlights a preference to copy individuals who are likely to have greater knowledge. However, it's impossible from uh, this study to tease apart whether all or only one of the characteristics, so age, dominance, or prior experience, actually drove the model-based bias. Now, finally, it's important to highlight that these findings actually echo earlier findings uh, by Dora, Dora Biro et al with wild chimpanzees. So they gave wild chimpanzees whole novel nuts to crack and found that the chimps tended to only observe individuals that were older than them and ignored juvenile individuals who were interacting with the nuts. So this does echo these uh, studies that we have seen in captivity. So now let's briefly consider what the implications of such model-based biases might be for wild chimpanzees. And the first implication is that a bias towards observing and copying only high-ranking individuals may actually influence the extent and longevity of behavioural traditions, resulting in a restriction on the accumulation of innovations. So this argument relies on the fact that a meta-analysis of captive and wild primate data by Simon Reeder and Kevin Leyland found that subordinate individuals tend to be the innovators in chimpanzee groups. So a tendency to copy high ranking individuals in terms of dominance or age would ensure that few arbitrary innovations where it's easy to switch between different alternatives would become established as traditions. And this explains the observation of field primatologists like Nishida that chimpanzees produce many innovations but few actually become traditions. And this could also provide a partial explanation as to why we see little evidence of cumulative culture in chimpanzees, despite them being our closest primate relatives. Now, if subordinates produce beneficial innovative behavioural modifications to a trait, but others don't copy them, then this could explain why we don't see strong evidence for the evolution of tool use strategies over time in chimps. And although this apparent lack of cumulative culture in chimpanzees is currently hotly contested in the field, um, You'll hear more about cumulative culture in a later lecture by Nico Cladieri. But if you're interested in this particular debate, you can see reviews uh, by me in collaboration with Lewis Dean and Jill Vale. So taken as a whole, you can see how the variety of context-dependent social learning strategies I've mentioned 
could have implications for um, cultural patterns. For example, when acting simultaneously, these social learning strategies may explain the surprising maintenance of cultural diversity between neighboring populations of animals, including humans, despite these populations sharing a similar ecology and the existence of frequent migrations of individuals between such neighboring populations. So a nice example of this is work by Lydia Luntz et al on cultural differences in hammer choice to crack uh, cooler nuts in three neighboring communities of wild chimpanzees in the Thai forest on the Ivory Coast. Now they studied three neighboring communities who had very similar ecology and shared female migrants who carried with them knowledge about cooler nut cracking. Now the thing with cooler nuts is that um, as they dry they become softer so chimpanzees can transition from using stone hammers to crack them to the more readily available wooden hammers as the season progresses. However, of the three community studies, one community actually persists with the energy and efficient strategy of using the difficult to find and heavy stone hammers to crack the nuts, even when those nuts have become soft and a wooden hammer would do the job. And this is despite the fact that wooden hammers are readily available to them. And, and also this, this group contains migrant females who have in their natal groups used wooden hammers in the past to crack these nuts later in the season. We can, however, attempt to explain this puzzling pattern using the context dependent uh, transmission biases I've already introduced you to. So firstly, it's possible that um, immigrants conform to the technique displayed by the majority of individuals in the new group. Similar to the arguments you've already heard for foraging preferences of immigrant vervet monkeys and great tits. Secondly, immigrants may copy what they observe in their new community due to state based biases. So in other words, because they're uncertain of the most adaptive behavior in the new community due to potential differences in ecology. In addition, female immigrants are always of low rank when they join a new community. And we know that low-rank chimpanzees are more susceptible to social information. Uh, and this is from the study of captive chimpanzees I highlighted before, but also from reports in wild chimpanzees. So in addition, in Erica's study of vervet monkeys that you heard about before, the only migrant male who did not switch to the new food tradition, for example, eating blue food, despite his prior knowledge that blue food tasted awful, was one who was able to enter the new group at a high rank. And he was the only individual who didn't switch preferences. Finally, given that immigrant females are of low rank, and we have evidence that chimps have model-based biases of copying high rankers, even if the immigrant females did display the use of wooden hammers when the nuts were soft, they are unlikely to be copied. And so this means that the community maintains its distinct tradition for continued use of stones to crack cooler nuts throughout the whole season. So in our 2015 paper, um, we suggested that a combination of several simultaneous biases or social learning strategies may be responsible for the patterns of cultural variation observed in chimpanzees and perhaps in humans as well. So this brings us to the end of this lecture segment and in the next section we'll move on to considering content dependent social learning strategies.